Aloha, I'm Lila Berg, and we are here at the Waikiki Shell, ready to meet the people who inform, inspire, and impact our daily lives. Thank you for tuning in to Island Focus. Where are we here, Ralph? Here we're in the pool area of the Waikiki Shell, which is now is going to be the Tom Wafit Waikiki Shell. It opened in 1956 in September. There was a water, dancing waters, and they had these mechanisms to... So like know, fountains. Like fountains. <laughs> so there was like a big moat here with no fish in it, but it was called the pool area. It was called the pool area. So people always say, what are you talking about, Ralph? What's the pool area? I said, well, there was water there. So we have pictures that, you know, that to prove that there was a, a, a dancing water. Fabulous. Here. Thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> Mahalo for tuning in to Island Focus and joining me in meeting Ralph Barres, who is the events coordinator here at the Waikiki Shell. Glad you could be with us. Thank you for inviting me today on a beautiful day here in the morning. It's oh. so exciting for me to be on stage with you. I know it's exciting for you to, even after all these years, to be working here. But the privilege to be at the Waikiki Shell is historic. You know, I, uh, I love Diamond Head. And this sits at the foot of Diamond Head. And to work a show on the foot of Diamond Head, it was a dream. And I got this job, you know, when I got out of high school in 1971, and I've been here ever since. And some of the big shows that I did work that were sold out was like Cecilia Coporno and Kalapana, Macau Sansa Need Hall with Brother Is, and so forth. And some of my memorable ones were maybe I worked from 1977 all 30 years to 2007 on the Cousin Marrow show. And you know, and you, name, you make some of those names and it gives you chicken skin because it's not only history, um, it's place, it's who we are here in Hawaii. You know, when I Come to work. There's a certain time of the evening when the sun goes down, oh. and I have to do a, a sound check and work with the technicians, the sound people. I would walk out out front of the, to the beach, and you know, doing both, watching the <laughs> sunset here and listening if the sound levels were you know too loud. Magic. And so another magic point is throughout the night, I would wait for the if there was a full moon, and I would wait until. The stuff, moon would come over Diamond Head. It was like a sunrise to me. Yeah. And yeah. it's such a magical time to see the moon come over Diamond Head. And you have a great act playing at the same time. And for some reason, there would always be a song that would be connected <laughs> with the moon. The Mahina. Funny how that works, right? <laughs> it's, it's like you can't put it to words. It's like, yeah. and, uh, so yeah. I would never know what to expect. But even though I've been here you know, for a number of years and grew up here, I still look forward to, to work here. The this. shell represents more than just entertainment or gathering. I know for you, you're saying it represents your history and your whole connection with Hawaii. What do you think the symbol of the shell represents to visitors? I think they, they come through and they, 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 they can relate because they're looking for hula dancers or they're looking for something local. And we always have local events here. And you know, some, but we do have main acts that come here, from um, from rock stars, from Willie Nelson. I've the met Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama, <laughs> as a speaker. And, and you plan those events? Are you the you're the coordinator of no, scheduling? No, I I do the scheduling for the ushering staff, wow. and I do the hiring for the ushering staff. And you were also. an usher here too. And I started off as an usher, <laughs> so you know it shows that you know you can with hard work you can move yourself up. And so you also got not only to meet and, and, and greet the stars, but also to see the impact that they have on the audience. It just so happens sometimes you'll stumble into that situation and yeah. you're like, wow, you know, how <laughs> lucky was I, you know, to have, you know, just somehow got to have that evening with that, 
entertainment. And I endeavor. would like to suggest that they were very lucky to meet you to, with your aloha and with your um, welcoming spirit, uh, which is really what Hawaii is about and what the shell represents. Thank you. And I would add to that, that because I do the hiring, I see, you know, I have the opportunity to hire people and they grow with me with the career yeah. at the Waikiki Show. Well, thank you very much for sharing your career with us and your joy. And uh, we'll look forward to chatting with you another time. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for your time. You've had the opportunity to meet Ralph Vares, who is the events coordinator at the Waikiki Show. Aloha. Aloha, I'm at the Waikiki Shell with Trini Kaupuiki, who is the CEO of Make-A-Wish Hawaii. Happy you could be with us. So wonderful to see you and to be in your energy of joy. This uh, is a new position for you. It is. I'm six months in and loving it. I really am. Why this position means so much to you? You know, I've always had a heart for our mission, Make-A-Wish Hawaii. I've always been uh, involved in the community in different ways. Um, I'm sure that people who don't know that about me are going, how do you go from, you know, weather anchor, news reporter, um, you know, host, anchor to, to Make-A-Wish. But um, if you remember, there was the Lokahi a Giving Program and the Lima that was um, kind of the nonprofit arm of KHON2 News, which I spearheaded for more than 10 years. Uh, people right. may not know that. Um, and I also did a lot with other nonprofits, Special Olympics Hawaii, Hospice Hawaii, um, managing the solicitation efforts of their board. Um, and as a reporter, I covered a lot of Make-A-Wish stories. So that's always been close to my heart. Um, so it may not, you know, it, it's not as uh, out of left field as people might think, but it's wonderful to be a part of and that. And it's the role of CEO. So Make-A-Wish, our mission is to grant life-changing wishes for children uh, who have critical illnesses. So we've been doing that in Hawaii for more than 35 years. We have a staff of about 25 people, 700 volunteers. I feel like it's the best job in the world. Imagine creating life-changing wishes for children. And what would a wish be as an example? You know, it could be anything, anything that their imagination can come up with. A computer, with. a trip to Disneyland. Um, sure. I mean, typically wishes fall into four categories. Mm -hmm. I wish to be, I wish to have, I wish to go, I wish to meet, and then some children I wish to give. Hmm. So, um, but we've, gosh, just this year, we've had wishes, uh, children who never got to see grandparents. So they want, wow. you know, their wishes to go to the mainland. Disneyland, I wish to see snow for the first time. I wish to be a recording artist. The power of the wish is... It is, and, and I'm glad you, you mentioned that because a week after I started, I went to Kapi'olani Hospital for their grand rounds. It's something that they do weekly uh, where they present different topics. And for the first time ever in the country, they presented Make-A-Wish. Wow, that's, so that's symbolic. <laughs> imagine doctors talking about the power of a wish. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard doctors say how they're able to treat their patients, give them medicine, treat them, but they're never able to give them what Make-A-Wish has been able to give them, which is hope, something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. And doctors say that when children come back from their wish, they are much more compliant with treatment. So it's, it's, it was very powerful. There was not a dry eye in the room. I kept looking through my purse and thinking, oh, I hope I can find a dirty napkin because no one warned me to bring some Kleenex. Well, and, yeah. and when we think about the power of a wish for all of us, not all of these children um, are terminally ill. Yes. But they also don't know it. That's true. Some of our children, of course, do pass on, but many of them, most of them, do live on to be happy, healthy adults. It's so wonderful when you see the community come together yeah. and get involved because it's not just the wish child whose life is changing. It's their family. It's the community that helped grant this wish. And it really is a community because it takes a lot of people to make this happen. Absolutely. And I'm sure the power of the wish and hope strengthens the parents as well. Absolutely. It's giving the children strength to carry on with their medical journey, it gives the family hope. And also when, you know, say their wish is to go to Disneyland, that time there, not thinking about, a, you know, doctor's right. visits, and it just brings the family together. It's a much needed time for them to spend and, and just have fun. 
one quick message to the audience, what would that be? I just want people to, if they've ever, you know, had an interest in learning more about Make-A-Wish, come to our website, go to our website, hawaii.wish.org. There's so many ways to volunteer. We have events year round. They can be a wish grantor, a wish ambassador. Um, of course, you know, they can fundraise for us and help us grant more wishes than and ever. And they can come and chat with you. Yes, I would love that, <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and we wish you all the best. Thank you so much. We've just had the opportunity to meet Trini Kapuiki in her new role as CEO of Make-A-Wish Hawaii. Mahalo. Thank you for joining me in meeting Bob Ballard, who is the Science Officer with the Central Pacific Hurricane Center. Appreciate you being with us. Thank you. I'm, I'm a little bit nervous asking you the question uh. about hurricanes, I think as everyone might be, but as Science Officer, you have not only a very important role, but several roles to play. Yeah, we're back into hurricane season once again, so we're encouraging everyone to, to be ready for it. One of my jobs uh, at the Central Pacific Hurricane Center is forecaster training and readiness. So I help uh, make sure that everyone's ready to go, that we know what we're supposed to do when the hurricane threatens. Uh, another job that we focus on is when the hurricane is threatening, uh, there's a team of us that actually make the forecast for tropical storms and hurricanes when something is coming toward the islands or really anywhere in the Central Pacific. We're all over that. We're making the five-day forecast. We're telling people where it's going to go. And then, of course, as you mentioned, an, another role that we have uh, is in outreach and trying to get folks to understand the hurricane threat for Hawaii and be ready for it. Do what you need to do to get ready so that when, it, when it's here, uh, you're not scrambling trying to get things ready to go. It's so uncomfortable to think about what could happen. And I'm sure you deal with that all the time. Right. It, it's really difficult because Hawaii, most of the time, the weather's beautiful. People don't want to think about it. They've got lots of activities. Of course, we're all busy. Uh, everybody wants to get out and enjoy the paradise that we live in. But we have to remember that we are a hurricane-prone state, and that threat always exists June through November. So we want people to kind of have that in the back of their mind, spend a little time at the beginning of the season getting ready, and then do what you need to do so that when the the threat is here, whenever that is, if it's this year or next year, you can be ready to go as soon as that happens. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and I appreciate you sharing that, you know, especially reminding sure. the audience to be prepared because being on Oahu, we've been spared. Not we've good. been really lucky. <laughs> we yeah. have been lucky, which doesn't mean that that's with the changing climate conditions and um, weather patterns. Yeah. That might not be always true. Even before with Iniki hitting Kauai, and Hurricane Eva going by Oahu and Kauai back in the early 80s. We know that the islands, uh, when conditions are right in the Central Pacific Ocean, uh, that we can be threatened by hurricanes. So you never know from year to year whether or not that the islands are gonna be in or out of it, but you need to be prepared as though that could happen. And so yeah. that's, that's what we remind everyone, yeah. It's a big... How did you get into this business? Cause it's a little scary. Yeah, well, I've, <laughs> I've been in the National Weather Service for 20, uh, 27 years. Uh, I've worked in different offices around the country, but I settled down in Hawaii at, in the year 2000. Um, really was fascinated with what we do out here and the message that we, that we pass along. Uh, it's really, the, the weather here day to day sometimes is not super exciting. It's, it's really beautiful. <laughs> but knowing what can happen, uh, the types of events that we've had in the past, when the weather gets bad here, it gets really bad. The message and trying to get people ready for that and do good forecasts for them. That's really important to us. You share your energy in such a positive way yeah. that actually it, it makes me think too that paying attention to the weather um, could be interesting. Yeah, well, I, I think a lot of, for example, the surfers, a lot of those folks are really into keeping track of the weather, mm -hmm. the large scale weather over the Pacific because that impacts them being able to get in the water and they like to know what's going on and you get sort of an interest about it. Anyone who's flying or on a boat needs to know about the weather. But day to day, you know, not super exciting, but when, when there's big things happening, uh, it's important for folks to dial in and kind of 
you know, spend a little time paying attention to that. And not just for hurricanes, but flash floods, you know, like the big windstorm that we had back earlier this year, I think that was back in February. You know, we wanted people to be ready for those events. They don't come often, but when they're here, they can have big impacts. As a closing comment, besides being prepared, what, how might you calm the waters for us? Yeah, so we don't want people to panic, and that's part of the preparedness message is being ready in sort of a background state all the time ensures that you don't have to panic, that you're not fighting those crowds and, and trying to get into the big box stores and trying to get all your supplies when it's too late. If you have some of that uh, at the ready all the time, and again, not just for hurricanes, but for other disasters that the islands are, are possibly prone to, then you are more ready to go and more part of that weather ready nation that we're looking for. Thank you very much for sharing your ideas and we'll look forward to hearing a little bit more in good weather. <laughs> Hopefully you. we'll keep it that way. <laughs> thank you. And thank you too for joining me in my conversation with Bob Ballard, who is the science officer for the Central Pacific Hurricane Center. Aloha. This is a very special room to you. Definitely is. Well, what do we see here on the walls well, and in the these album? These are some of the posters that we had from the recent and to the past. And we have a book here and also the picture. So this picture here is the beginning of 1956 when they opened. And as you can see, it was completely lawn. There's no seating in the middle. And then there was the pool, which is the water, which reflected the shell itself. And you have pictures of performers and as well. Yes, <laughs> Harry Belafonte. Harry Belafonte. <laughs> this is like his uh, statehood, 1959. Mm. Harry Belafonte played here, as well as Frank Sinatra. He was here in October 2nd, 1960. And your favorite, my favorite performance after all these years? I think because I enjoy hula and my family does, I think working all the shows at the Cousin Merrill's, one of the most memorable ones when Rolling went up in the lift and went to the top of the shell. I, I remember of, that one. I think a lot of people do remember yeah. it. And that's why sometimes it always goes back to that. <laughs> Thank you for reminding us. Thank you. Thank Aloha. You. I'm here today at the Waikiki Shell with Dr. Bruce Anderson, who is the director of Hawaii's Department of Health. Happy you could be with us. So nice to see you again. I never know where you're going to show up and in what career field. <laughs> I was actually uh, scheduled to be on your show uh, about a year ago when we had one of our hurricanes come by. And, uh, that was the show was postponed, so it's good to be here. In this role, you're revisiting again as director of Department of Health. You had mm. this a few years ago. Coming back now mm. uh, with maturity and more experience in other fields, um, what are you finding is different, and where are we? Well, I'm older now, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> More but, patient. Yeah, yeah. The issues have changed. Um, you know, and 20 years ago when I was there, we were, we were working on trying to stop people from smoking cigarettes. Mm. Now it's e-cigarettes, and we're worried about kids smoking uh, e-cigarettes and getting hooked on nicotine. Mm. So the, the issues have changed a bit. We have rat lungworm, for example. That was there back then, but it wasn't a focus like it is now. And there are lots of things that have, have really changed, but, but things have stayed the same. My job hasn't changed too much. I'm, I'm basically an advocate for the 3,000 plus health professionals at the health department. And I do provide some direction when, when I think it's needed. Um, for example, on the Red Hill tanks, things that people worry about, we'll say, look, look at drinking water. I've taken a fairly strong position that we need to look at um, removing those tanks and moving the fuel to another place, which is not above the drinking water aquifer there. We all depend on, at least it presents a long-term risk. Um, and but, with, but, you have such a varied background in, in different professions, mm -hmm. with water and ocean and hurricane mm -hmm. preparedness. Your focus now as your director of health is even more holistic, I would imagine. I love the water. Uh, climate change, by the way, is a, is a, a focus area for us. Uh, we had two near misses last year from hurricanes and, and of course, tropical storms that are, are going to continue to, to threaten Hawaii. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of what we're doing in that area is to try to get um, people prepared to 
build resiliency in the community. And when we do get uh, hit by a large storm, that we're able to respond and, and help communities recover. And I would imagine the whole homeless conversation impacts Department uh, of Health. Yeah, that was there 20 years ago, but it's, it's more of a problem now. It's at, at least 20 or 30 percent of the, uh, the homeless have substance abuse or mm. behavioral health problems. And, um, and many of those are going untreated. People take these individuals to the emergency rooms when they're acting out or having problems. And often they're, they're discharged without any treatment. Of course, they end up back in the emergency room the next day or, or within a few days. And that's expensive. It's not good for the, anyone. It, it clogs up the emergency rooms and uh, prevents uh, the hospitals from providing care. But more importantly for the individuals, it's, it's a revolving door that has mm -hmm. no end. So we're looking at uh, trying to set up some short-term uh, stabilization beds. And in fact, that's one of the things we're focused on right now is to have a place where the police can take someone other than the emergency rooms, mm. where they can get the treatment and support they need and become stabilized so that they don't end up back in the emergency rooms and so that they can live their lives. What gives you joy in that department? Well, well, there's a lot of satisfaction in it. And honestly, I, I enjoy working with the, the, uh, the people there. You know, as I mentioned, we've got a, a, a huge number of very dedicated staff who are, who are working on issues that they really are passionate about. And I think that that's, that's ha satisfying in itself. And I might add, I, I really enjoy working for Governor Ige. He's passionate too about um, caring for the community and making sure that it, it's a uh, uh, we're doing the right thing. So it's it's been a pleasure all around. At my age, it's not it's important who you work with. <laughs> and you're still surfing, and who you work I know for. too. <laughs> I enjoy getting in the water, uh, fishing or surfing any any way I can. So we have to bring this conversation to a close at the moment. But thank you very much for giving us your face again and your manao, uh, and we look forward to hearing a little bit more in the future. Glad to join you again. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> We've had the opportunity to meet Dr. Bruce Anderson, who's director with the Department of Health here in the state of Hawaii. Aloha. We have the opportunity today to meet Iran Ganat, who is the coach of the men's basketball team at the University of Hawaii. Glad you could be with us. Thanks for having me. Happy to on, be here. On a different kind of stage than you usually are. A great stage your, too, your... obviously great weather. <laughs> so I'm happy to, like I said, I'm excited to be here. Tell us a little bit about your, your team this year, your philosophy, and um, why Hawaii is so special for you. Well, I'm excited about our team. I think each year we've gotten better. I think we'll take another step. We have good continuity. We have a lot of guys back. We'll be bigger and stronger. And in the process, we've improved our facilities. So uh, setting up for kind of a, a big breakthrough this year. So I'm really excited about that. I think Hawaii is a special place. You know, I, we talked earlier, I'm from New Jersey and here I am <laughs> feeling very comfortable and at home raising my family in Hawaii. And that speaks to how special it is. I've always said when you can be 5,000 miles away from home and feel like you're at home. So very blessed. Well, and, and I've watched you on TV, you know, and the, the way you work with the kids. You have a natural way of encouraging them. It's not the personality of every coach. To what do you attribute that style of yours? Well, I think it's people you've been around. It's all about your upbringing, the coaches who've had an influence on me, the people you've been able to coach, the people you've been able to work with, and then obviously how I kind of like things. So. I think the kids get a lot of pressure and they put a lot on themselves. I don't need to add to that. We kind of have a simple philosophy of truthful and honest, direct, demanding, but not demeaning. Obviously the whole success of a team is not only kids working together, but doing their individual best. And you bring that out in them. Well, I hope, I think that's what we're paid to do kind of. And mm -hmm. so uh, you got, and that's the best part of putting a team together every year. And every year we have different personalities and different uh, combinations and, Look, I love to do what I do because I love to compete. I love being part of a team and I love the game. And the game changes all the time too, but your, your ability to get each guy to play at their best within the framework of the team is paramount. So everything we talk about within our core values has to be reflected on the court. We share the ball offensively, we have each other's <laughs> back defensively, and we have great support for each other on the bench. How much influence do you think 
youth sports has on a collegiate athlete? I think it's a big hot topic. I know we talked about it earlier now with uh, a, lot, a lot of specialization, a lot of hours these kids have put in. And that's a critical, like I say all the time, I don't take our jobs lightly. We get these kids at 18 and 22 years old, which is a critical time in their life. Well, even more important when they're, you know, at the youth level. So uh, like I said earlier about why I coach, I want to make sure they understand why they play. They can't lose the love for the game. I think to be great at anything, you got to be happy. And to be happy, you got to do what you love, where you love, with people you love. And I want to make sure I have an eight-year-old that she, and I don't, I'm not big on specialization. I want, I think uh, these kids should play everything and they should learn different sports and different, it attacks different parts of your body and your mind. So what and, sports does your daughter play? She plays everything. I mean, she <laughs> plays basketball, she plays soccer. She's going to be at volleyball camp. I mean, we have all the camps at UH, obviously, and she does a little bit of everything. She does, uh, she's in, into the piano and studying extra Japanese and music class. And I love that. And you got to let them kind of find their way and see what their passion is and chase their passion. It's their passion, not mine or yours. And that's a really good springboard for the, the question about the role of parents in yep. sports. You know, I was a single mom of a son. I was always um, commented upon how loud I was at the games. So what am I, wife? <laughs> <laughs> but the loudness is really encouraging kids and, and my own excitement to be out there because I never played team sports. What might you say to parents now that are, are so worried about their children getting into college or being the perfect kid or succeeding in life? Let them live their lives. Let them uh, fail and prosper and go through the ups and downs. Just, uh, you know, I tell our guys, I know I shared with you earlier, when we talk, our, our programs run like a family, but there are certain things within the specifics of playing time and on the team. I tell our, we'll sit with the parents and the, and the player and we'll say to the player, we coach you, we don't coach your parents. Yeah. <laughs> and then to the parents, we'll say, sit back, relax, and enjoy the game. We have enough coaches. I think the kids nowadays, they put enough pressure on themselves. Mm. So when you say, I know we talked earlier about being a spirit support, I think that's great. Um, but I, I don't want, I don't think we should want kids to play with uh, while they're active in their sport, looking over to see the reactions on the sidelines. They should know that that reaction is going to be one of support and applause and uh, you know, supporting them throughout. Appreciate your time, Coach, and good luck in this season. Thanks for having me. Thank you, too, for tuning in to Island Focus and listening to my conversation with Coach Aran Ganat of the UH men's basketball team. Thanks. Mahalo to the Waikiki Shell for hosting us today and to you for tuning in to Island Focus. I'm Lila Berg. Aloha and malama pono. Take care of each other. See you soon. <laughs>